Namaste. Well, now we have about 7,600 subscribers on the channel. And approximately half the views on the channel come from the subscribers. And the other half from non-subscribers. So there's probably about 15,000 unique people visiting the channel. Maybe not all the time, but, you know, now and again. But I get very few what I would call interesting questions from them. In fact, really, there's only one <laughs> out of all those people, one viewer who is asking good questions consistently. And so he emailed me yesterday with another question. And this one is a doozy. <laughs> Check it out. From what emanates the form that the divinity takes to appear to us, that of the divinity or ours? You spoke of your meeting with Lord Shiva taking the form of a lion, or rather having the head of a lion. Does this form come from your subconscious, or is it the will of the divinity to appear like this? We notice that these are often forms from our phenomenal world. Given that the universe is huge and there are probably other forms on other planets, why wouldn't these deities appear to us in unknown forms present in these phenomenal parallel worlds? That's a good question, huh? And it's one that I have devoted a lot of thought to over the years while trying to understand my own experience. Now, what he's referring to it is my story that Lord Shiva began to appear spontaneously to me in my mind in 1975, 1976, when I was living in Mayapur, India. So I didn't even know that it was Shiva. All I know is that this lion being is showing up in my mind and very friendly making joking words, and then disappearing. Poof! <laughs> and many years later, when I systematically tried to realize my Ishta Devata, that is, the form of God that is most uh, pleasing and close to my heart, he is the one that showed up. And then only a couple of years ago, two or three years ago, did he finally reveal to me that this was Shiva? That's when I got Shiva Darshan, and I realized that his mood, Shiva's mood, is exactly the same as this lion's mood. So the question is, does he come from my will or from the divine will? Well, to really answer this question, you have to assume the point of view of God. Why does God create the world? Why does Brahman specifically, that is changeless and one without a second, emanate this maya, uh, this illusion, called the material creation. And then, uh, that's, I mean, that's enough of a question to look at right from the beginning. He does it for his own self-realization. Brahman has no second. He is one only. So he cannot see himself. Brahman can only be himself. So to understand his own self, he needs a mirror. So the mirror that he creates, we call the creation. And what it is, is innumerable living beings spread over innumerable planetary systems and with innumerable different qualities and activities and natures and so on. 
And so in the mirror of their individualized consciousness, Brahman sees himself in all various aspects. Okay? So now, you have to put yourself in his shoes, <laughs> sandals, <laughs> feet, <laughs> and look at things from his point of view. What is he trying to do? He's trying to create an unlimited variety of viewpoints from which he can see himself reflected in their consciousness as if in a mirror. So, excuse me while I take a tea break. So he creates all of these unlimited forms with unlimited variety, each one unique. Now, imagine you're a farmer and you have this big garden and you're raising all kinds of vegetables, an unlimited variety of vegetables. And so some of these vegetables are like first class and you want to harvest them and enjoy them in your own meals. Some of them are like second class and you want to uh, maybe sell those to other people to enjoy. And some of them maybe don't turn out too good, you know, and so you just, you just throw them away or you throw them back or you use them for seed for the next planting. So God is doing something very similar with the living beings. The first class living beings are those who are capable of realizing Brahman, capable of self-realization, that is. So this is what he's after. This is what he wants. And these he keeps for himself and he enjoys them himself. But then the second class living beings who are not capable of realizing Brahman, but may be at some time in the future, he throws back. Huh? He throws back and they have to take another birth or several more births to, to get ripe, huh? to get ready for him to enjoy. And then the third class beings have no possibility of realizing Brahman, and he just throws those away or throws them back into samsara in the animals or plant species. So what's happening in a case like mine, which is the only one I can really speak to because, you know, it's my personal experience, that God, let's use the word God, to mean, you know, Shiva and Shakti, or Vishnu and Lakshmi, Brahma and Saraswati, because the two of them are actually one. They always appear together, they act together, and they produce offspring. And those offspring are us. So in the beginning of the universe, they produce offspring simply by mental power. Like, for example, Shiva produces Vishnu and Brahma. And then Vishnu and Bra Vishnu goes on to produce actually Brahma from his body. And they go on to produce several uh, generations of sons and daughters. But then at a certain point, sexual reproduction begins and both Lord Brahma and his descendants begin to reproduce by sex. And these are the jivas. These are the ones who are born. And they are, by definition, unrealized. And they have to go through many cycles of births and deaths to become realized and gain moksha, where they get the uh, company of the Supreme Lord in any one of his forms, 
uh, basically for the duration of the universe. So if this seems complicated, it's because it is. <laughs> you wouldn't expect the greatest intelligence to create something like dumb simple, would you? So his creation is marvelously sophisticated and complicated and includes all kinds of varieties. Now, as far as the beings who are ready for self-realization, he chooses them. They don't choose themselves. He chooses them to perform a very specific kind of service for him. Just like a gardener might pick certain vegetables and fruits for a specific dish that he wants to cook. And so these specific beings, he gives his darshan, he gives his vision, and he gives his association in his various forms. Now, the forms that he manifests are exactly suited and perfectly suitable for those specific individuals. And this is why, for example, he doesn't appear to devotees from Earth uh, like, you know, one of the spider beings of Deneb III. You know what I'm talking about? He appears as another human being or something close to a human being. Like, for example, in my case, a lion or a half-man, half-lion. This is called a Narasingha form. Sometimes he is a, a human body with a lion head. Sometimes he's 100% lion. Sometimes he's a mature lion. And sometimes he's a cute little baby cub and <laughs> just irresistible. <laughs> you just want to cuddle and pet him. <laughs> Because when he first appeared to me, he did not appear as God, you know. He appeared in a very almost whimsical way, a very humorous way, an extremely friendly way. And so he maintains this mood at all times. He, he never differs from it. I mean, of course, there are different pastimes and, and different activities where he goes through certain emotional changes, or appears to anyway. And, but those are all related to the basic mood of friendship. Friendship is how he wants to relate. So he manifested as a friend, and he was like that for, let me see, from 1975 through about 2015, 2000. Now it's almost 2025, 60 years. So all this time, he has been a staunch friend, actually my best friend. He's always there. He's always available. Huh? And only lately has he revealed that he is Shiva. And even when he manifests as Shiva and gives me darshan in that form, it's all very casual and friendly. You know, it's not like, I am God. No, it's, it's, <laughs> he's merely casual and very accepting and understanding of everything. So I hope this sheds some light on this deep question because this is a question that applies to everyone who aspires for self-realization. And that's why my Adi Guru said, I mean, several times, don't you try to see God, but act in a way so that God wants to see you. The idea is that he will come to you, he will reveal himself, and he will then take you to the spiritual world and engage you in his service in a very specific way. The way that he created you for. The way that he made you. 
And so the restrictions that appear in the scriptures and all are for the, the beginning level sadhus and devotees. Actually, God has no restrictions. He can do anything. He can be anything. And he can taste every kind of relationship. And so he will create you in the way that he wants for his enjoyment. And that becomes the Ishta Devata, or the most favored, most favorite, and most beloved friend. Aum Tat Sat. Aum Shakti Aum. Aum Namah Shivaya.